Well, let me let me start by saying again, we ultimately it's a, it's the the goal is that everyone who is eligible for the program can can get the benefit of the program and can get it um, you know with relative ease with um, you know follow, following the program requirements but you know not being onerous that they have the choice of doing that online in person on the phone that they have multiple ways of doing that. Um, ultimately, it is the recipient's choice you know ultimately whether to apply. But we want to make it. We want to make that an easy choice for them, and then we want to follow up appropriately. Um, we have several efforts underway in terms of improving. Again, identifying populations that are underserved, such as seniors, such as those that are receiving Medi-Cal that are not receiving CalFresh. Um, we have various outreach initiatives going on. Um, that's a high level. I see. Mr. Lightborn wants to speak. If I could just add, Senator. A couple of very specific areas. Um, we've been doing in internally a lot of work on sort of geocoding to try to get a feel for not just down to counties, but down to census tracts. What are the opportunities to identify additional eligible individuals and, and at least get information about the program to them so that they, they can make their choice? The, the other piece, which I, th I think has been suggested by several people and I think is, is one of our best opportunities is as the Affordable Care Act implementation continues, particularly for those people who are enrolled in the expanded Medicaid program, there is not one-to-one -one eligibility. The, the program rules are still different at the federal level, um, particularly in the areas of household composition. So we, we, we can't go to a place where it's simply, if you did this, that can automatically do that. But as we as people go through the state portal uh, at, the, at Covered California, where they're getting the opportunity there to indicate th whether they're interested in having counties follow up with them on other benefits, particularly CalFresh, that they may be um, eligible for. And that as that system becomes as robust as we think it will in the, in the, in the weeks ahead, that I think offers us a major opportunity to relatively efficiently um, get back to people. The most efficient would be a decision at the federal level to have the same rules apply to the, to the two programs. That will take congressional action yeah. and therefore is not something which I think we should plan around. But at the same time, um, th there are proxies and approximations that can, I think, narrow the focus of the, and we, that's why we've been referring to it as the in-reach, the people whose names we already yeah. or increasingly are starting to know. And so then if we can get information before them, as, Todd, uh, as Mr. Bland was saying, that makes it as straightforward and non-onerous as possible, I think that's one of our biggest opportunities. And is there something we can do through policy here or from a state perspective to help in that? or at least to get out of the way and keep right. from. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think that there are a few uh, policy components to improve alignment between Medi-Cal and CalFresh that we might be able to do here at the state level. Some of them are um, federally established, and so I, encourage, I would encourage the state to do that. Um, CFPA would also recommend that as we talk about these modernizations, that we really focus on a consistent level of access, regardless of geography, and that we're looking for uh, policies in which the state is setting standards or customer service expectations, goals that we'd want to reach, in addition to participation, that can get us all working toward the same place um, and really implementing these modernizations in a really consistent manner. So it doesn't matter what county you walk in uh, or what door you walk through, you're going to get that level of consistent service. Um, and, you know, and I would just add that I think, um, I, I just, we are doing a lot. This body uh, and uh, the folks next to me have been working nonstop on this issue. I think uh, across the board, bipartisanly, take hunger as a real affront to our democracy. Um, mm -hmm. and to the dignity of our great state. Um, and so there's a real serious, I think, focus on this issue and has been. I would say let's not let up. Let's not let up. You know, as you said, Senator uh, Jackson, we, uh, the goal isn't to have a whole bunch of people on CalFresh. Uh, poor people don't want to be on the CalFresh. They want jobs. Um, they they want to be working. They want to be productive and part of this, you know, this great economy. Um, but if they... Um, are working low-wage jobs, and if they're 
not working, un underemployed. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to prevent hunger. Um, I would start by removing any optional, um, any optional bans on benefits. Uh, you know, Senator Leno and Senator Hancock have both authored legislation that would remove lifetime bans on, on people to receive benefits, and I would continue to do that. It not only opens up access and gives people a fresh start to prevent hunger for them and their kids, um, but also reduces the, the barriers in, at the application and the bureaucracy of the program. Um, I think, uh, as Senator Torres said, reaching out to the student population, we could do a lot more here in the state to make sure that poor kids, when they go to school, aren't trying to do their homework, um, do their studies, excel there, and um, do that on an empty stomach. Um, I, I think that, um, uh, unfortunately, one of the biggest barriers to these eligible non-participating households is the narrative, the public narrative that we have about poverty in, Cal in California and the country. Um, this kind of politicking on the plates of poor people has to stop. Until we uh, acknowledge that and our leaders, uh, both conservative and uh, liberal, go out into the community and say, look, we're sorry you're poor, we want you to eat though, and, and invite people into the program, I don't think we're going to um, have any other, any more great jumps in participation. Thank you. Before I call on Senator Huff, uh, we have one more panel so that we can get to program integrity, so if we can uh, be as concise. Yes, go right ahead. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Good. I wasn't sure how you are phrasing that. Um, one of the comments, I think, by the chair was talking about unemployment and going up. It just raised the question, when someone goes on unemployment, are they automatically enrolled in CalFresh? Do they automatically qualify or they're? In fact, in fact, in most cases, that even the unemployment amount is too high to hmm. be under the threshold. Okay. There was a, a comment also that there are significant barriers that keep people from getting benefits. Can you describe those kind of barriers? Um, well, what we hear the most uh, is the paperwork. Uh, we, we, you know, and the focus of fraud. Uh, there's, there's already a lot that the county has to, by law, ask for. If somebody's working, for example, they need their pay stubs, they have access to their bank account, they need the social security numbers of everybody in the household, they, know, they need to know who's in the household, um, and, uh, and have all the, you know, the paperwork submitted, their IDs. Um, so there's a, there's a, if they have child care, they're, you know, up until recently the, pro the process, uh, the passage of Senator Leno's bill, um, the, pass the process of getting your child care receipts monthly into the, the office. Um, there's, there's quite, you have background checks through employment databases. There's all kinds of um, hurdles that people have to hop through. Uh, you do have to have an interview. Um, you have to, um, you, you maybe have to go into the office for the interview. Now we can do that interview um, by phone, which is really helpful for the rural communities. Um, and the, the rules are confusing. You know, uh, it's, it's, it, it's clear to us if we sit around and, and talk about the rules a lot, but for people who are just coming in and finding out about the program, um, there's a lot of questions. Or and maneuvering so, in a second language. And uh, some, some folks as well. So uh, uh, sitting on, we, we hear a lot of people sitting on phones for a lot and, and trying to get through um, because there has been an increase in caseload but not an increase in workers. Um, it's hard to get into a worker and, and get some of those questions answered. Um, those are the most uh, frequent complaints that we, we hear. Um, it's confusing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Senator Huff. Uh, we're going to thank uh, Ms. Fernandez and Ms. Bartholo and we're going to ask Ms. Patterson and uh, the director and deputy director to stay with us as we invite up Cheryl Spiller, Director of the Los Angeles County Department of Public Social Services, and also Kathy Harwell, who's the Director of the Stanislaus County Community Services Agency, so that we can begin to dig deeper into questions regarding program integrity. Thank you, Ms. Patterson. And with your permission, Chair yes. Leno, um, we're, go we're going to have Maria Hernandez, who's the Bureau Chief of Fraud, um, join us for this section. Very good.
We're also joined by Dennis Beals, who's the chief investigator for welfare fraud for the County of Los Angeles. We're glad Thank to have you, you, sir. Thank you. Would you like to be in? Yes, sure. I will. I will be brief. Um, turning to the program integrity, um, it, there, there's a dimension that is similar to access in that it's difficult, if not impossible, to compare California directly to other states. And let me explain the why of that. California is somewhat unique in that we still maintain, as a matter of policy, um, a significant TANF program in our state. A significant TANF program. TANF program, What yes. we call CalWORKs. Um, when you saw Ms. Bones' uh, slide at the, be at the beginning, she illustrated the difference in child poverty if CalFresh didn't exist and what the other programs represent. That's that other programs. And in California, we allow children to remain eligible even if the parents have become ineligible, which, make, which means that our focus on our, the way we approach operating our programs, CalWORKs and CalFresh, is very much focused on the, the accurate front-end eligibility determination. That's where our program integrity really lives. Um, now, if we ensure we're issuing benefits correctly, then we don't have to, in essence, uncover and recover on the same sort of scale that if there's a margin of error at the front end. And we've sort of consciously, I, I think, said to ourselves, with an accuracy rate of almost 98%, it's better to do it right first rather than be in sort of pay and chase mode as, 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 a, as a standard. However, the best eligibility system will not produce 100% accuracy. We know that. Even though Mr. Bland said that's our goal, um, we, we work towards it. Um, so we're committed to having the policies and the resources that correct those problems that do occur and have meaningful consequences for people who deliberately take benefits they're not entitled to. Um, obviously, a fair amount of the incorrect issuance is sort of innocent error or administrative error, but where it is deliberate, the, we, we have to pursue that. <laughs> Mr. Bland and our colleagues from Los Angeles and Stanislaus counties will elaborate on those procedures and additional measures, but I would just like to sort of put them in the context of the world in which we're living and trying to operate in, in CDSS. Just since the last time this was sort of a discussion of, of review and the, the last audits, and et cetera, we've had a number of sort of world changes in our environment. Um, most notably, ACA was adopted, um, and with it, the creation of a whole new technology that we have to make our SOAS systems work with and which will ultimately provide us good, we hope, good identity verification sorts of benefits, income verification information, but that's a developmental process. Second, with the passage of AB6 um, and semi-annual reporting, as well as other major changes in the CalWORKs program that have occurred in recent years, um, we've our systems have been re-engineering for those. Um, and while our priority in California has historically been on initial verification uh, determination and doing it right, there has been a growing national concern about trafficking of benefits in the SNAP program. And, and just to clarify what we mean by that, these are people who legitimately have the benefit. It wasn't that they got the benefit fraudulently, but they are using it for an unauthorized purpose. It may be very casual, or it may be more systematic than that. Um, California sort of was in the lead among states in terms of things like restricting EBT access at certain um, locations, adult entertainment facilities, casinos, et cetera, where there was a feeling that that pointed towards potential abuse of benefits. Um, we were also a sort of a pioneer leader in looking at the fact that there was benefit trafficking going on on social media, and our IT shop cre has created sort of automated tools to constantly scan social media, as has some of our counties, so that we can identify and bring those down. And some, not all, of the social media are very cooperative with us in terms of immediately removing what we identify. Um, USDA Food and Nutrition Service has asked us to focus on 
use of benefits at certain high profile retailers where they've, they have determined that there is systematic trans improper transactions occurring. We've developed a sort of a stakeholder plan to do that. I just want to make a note about stake our stakeholder role. We're the biggest state, we have the most participants, and one of the ways we get things done effectively is we directly involve our counties, we directly involve legal advocacy groups in the development of plans, development of regs, develop, and that way we don't have false starts. We don't start out and then get stopped in a court case or whatever and go back to zero all over again. That can be frustrating to some people because it does take time. Um, good process does take time. Democracy does take time, and getting it right takes time. Um, we're on target to be able to report um, those retailer transactions to FNS um, on an agreed-on schedule, and, and that is moving forward. So I just wanted to conclude by saying our goal is clear. Our path is circuitous sometimes. There are other issues that crop up that pull us this way and that way, but we're very clear that at the end of the day, we want a system that is giving benefits just to those who are eligible for it and where there are any patterns of abuse to it, we want to be able to deal with it. That said, we are a county-run system, and we have to defer certain judgments, and we should defer certain judgments, to local policymakers who are deciding on the balance of where to put their focus, their energies, their efforts, and local prosecutors make decisions about what activities they wish to, to, to focus on. So with that, let me stop yeah, and see if Fernandez Mr. Bland has anything to add before our county Thanks. policy. Thank you. I, I'd like to... I'd like to give a sort of an overview of the, of the hierarchy of how CDSS and how we think about uh, essentially the critical role that fraud prevention and detection play in the administration of public benefit programs. Um, as, as I mentioned earlier, the, the first part of our kind of our, our four-part hierarchy is, is that eligibility work. It's that upfront correct benefit determination. That is um, a key part of that. And the Federal Food and Nutrition Services recognize that. In their communication with us, they have applauded our work on our, on our error rate and, and recognize that as a fraud measure. Um, the second in the hierarchy is essentially uh, preventing and minimizing um, and detecting fraud up front. Um, this is essentially what we call early fraud is all of the things we do, and I'm going I'm to give you a little more detail in a moment, that we do at the time of application. Um, the third part of our hierarchy looks at ongoing. It looks at, well, wait, have there been changes in income? Are there been things, changes in the household? Are there things going on in there that would make the person ineligible, make the family ineligible? How can we track that? How can we, pr how can we detect that? And how can we take appropriate action? And then, as, as Director Lightborn was just saying, the, the fourth area moves into the issues around um, essentially sort of misuse of the benefit, which, which is somewhat of a uniquely a CalFresh issue. Um, it's, a, it's a food benefit. It's to, it's to be used for food. To be used for something else is a program violation. Um, something we've been working on with the federal government is what they call their system of an alert case. I'll just briefly say what that is. An alert case, you can think of it as it's a closed store. It's a store that the uh, inspector general and the Food and Nutrition Service, and they completely control this. We do not say which stores are allowed to participate. The federal government makes that decision. It's a store where they've said, you have engaged in trafficking. You have, you have not followed procedures, and we're, we're, we're eliminating your access to those cards and the program. When they do that, um, that takes them many months, they then provide to, to us, to the state, and then we pass on to the counties, essentially they say, um, here's a list of clients that transacted at the store with uh, something a little bit, not, not just that they were at the store, but uh, something a little bit, uh, little bit suspicious in the transaction, perhaps repeated similar dollar amounts, perhaps a dollar amount that's just not consistent with the amount of food we sort of knew was in the rather small convenience store. So that's what an alert case is. Um, and essentially, we refer those on to the counties. Um, Mr. Lightborn also mentioned our, our integrity plan work group. So basically, in, in response to sort of following up on that, we, we convened an integrity group in 2012. And one of, the, one of the recommendations of that group was essentially that there would be a warning letter issued to everyone on an alert case. And we started that process. Um, uh, we started issuing the alert letters over the summer, and now I'm 
just managed to misplace how many exactly we had um, issued since September. I want to say it's three or 3,700? 1,400? I thought it was, okay. About 1,400 letters have been issued already. Um, that's sort of the, the hierarchy. Now I'd like to turn um, to talking a little bit more about one of our main systems for doing this, and that's called EVES, the Income Eligibility and Verification System. Um, there's really two parts to EVES. There's applicant EVES, and that system is actually maintained as an electronic data system actually by the Department of Healthcare Services. There's a separate program called recipient EVES, which is actually maintained by our department. But applicant EVES is essentially where is a system of five matches with five different entities. It's a match against unemployment insurance and disability insurance records. It's a match against wages. Those are both with EDD. It's also a match against assets, and that's a run against uh, FTB, the Franchise Tax Board. And there's also a run against um, Social Security verification with the Social Security Administration. And finally, uh, there's a citizenship verification piece that goes to um, USCIS. Um, those are essentially run by the eligibility workers, and they are done at the time of application, and they play a critical role in, in, up, in that upfront detection, upfront getting it right. Um, the applicant, I'm sorry, the, the recipient EVES is, is actually, uh, that's, what, that's what we do on more of the ongoing basis. Um, that's actually a system of 10 different matches, but here think, um, I, I'm not a big IT person, but think more like batch processes and runs. Um, this is not, this is done throughout the year. Um, six of these are run monthly, uh, one is run quarterly. One is semi-annual, two are run annually, and they involve six different entities, again, some of the same ones. They involve runs against EDD records, Social Security Administration, Franchise Tax, and in this case, IRS, and also the Department of Justice, and also the California Department of Corrections and Rehab. Um, now, if I can, I'd like to bring you back into the handout that I gave you at the beginning of the hearing and move you to page four. I'm just going to take you at a high level through kind of the system of referrals for investigations and the results of those investigations, and then I'd love to turn it over to the county experts who can tell you what happens at the county level. Um, the first chart is essentially on page four, and what this shows you is a multi-year look at the number of, and this is CalFresh only, our county partners and we are, are doing similar things for, for CalWORKS and Medi-Cal and, and, and other, but this is just the CalFresh numbers. For, typically, over the last decade, about two to 250,000 re referrals for investigations come in, um, and virtually all of those are accepted. Um, the third, uh, a, a, small, a small amount are considered um, uh, not enough information to pursue. The vast majority are there. What I wanted to show in this chart is it's been a fairly, fairly steady number over the past decade. Um, if you turn the page, I'm now going to kind of zoom us in from a multi-year kind of multi-year look to, to now zooming into one recent quarter. Um, you'll see there that the, we, we received about 57, 58,000 um, referrals were received. 8% um, were rejected for um, essentially not, not enough information there and could not be assigned out. The vast majority were accepted, 92%. Um, the 53,000, again, is similar to, again, you multiply that by four, that's one quarter's worth it, very similar, very consistent with that picture I showed on the first page. Um, turning to the next page, I want to I wanna get to the concept of sort of this early versus ongoing. Um, we have two columns here, first showing sort of the results of, of fraud investigations in terms of which ones have findings, that's kind of the top half, and I'm gonna, we're going to break that down a little more in the in a moment, but for now, I want to I want to call your attention to the distinction between early all that work going on at application that, that um, in fact there were 10,000 investigations uh, with findings in the quarter versus the ongoing work. Again, that different set of matches, the different kinds of referrals we're getting for the ongoing. That's a smaller part of it. Combined, about 15,000 with um, with um, with findings, and then as you can see below, um, there are there are lots of investigations that do not have findings. Um, but essentially, also comparing the total there, 50,000 again at the bottom. So slightly more. If we looked, if you, if you don't need to look back at the prior chart. But essentially, showed we accepted about 53,000 in the quarter, and we disposed of 50,000. They are not the same. We we are working off of a case load. We are not working with the. Um, we're not one for one resolving them in a month. Each investigation takes a different amount of time. Um, but I think it illustrates the difference. Uh, our attention to that upfront and early fraud. Um, the next chart, basically, uh, turning to the next page, uh, 
takes essentially the vertical percent, and to keep it simple, I've sort of dropped the, uh, dropped the reference to the early and ongoing. But as again, about 29% of our cases have a finding. Um, and uh, those range from essentially denial and discontinuous and reduction in benefits. Those are the largest in terms of the numbers. And in a moment, we'll get to dollars. Uh, that's where you would find those. Um, the, the more serious fraud, the intentional fraud, um, those are the cases referred for prosecution and for administrative hearing and for intentional program violations. Um, about 29 percent, again, with findings. Below that, I'm showing you the investigations without findings. Uh, about 45 percent of the time, ultimately, we conclude the allegation was unfounded. Other times, we might have concerns, but there was insufficient total evidence. And a recognition of the workload and, 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 and that there's a lot of work here. Um, some, some, some investigations cannot be, cannot be finished necessarily in time, and you do have a little bit uh, where we just don't get to it, but it's a relatively small percent. Um, finally, uh, I'd like to take you to the last page. Um, this is, again, that same quarter. It's just one quarter's worth of activity, and it's just one month's worth of benefits, but basically denials of benefits about almost $1.9 million related to the activity in that quarter. Discontinuance, uh, another uh, almost, a, almost a million, and then another 300000 in reduction, or about $3.1 uh, uh, million. Uh, essentially, th those are avoided. Um, that's just one month. The, the average time on CalFresh is in the range of 20, 20 months or so. Uh, it, it's a little too simple to just multiply that by 20 because things happen, we might have detected the fraud in a different way, but you get, the, you get, you get a sense of the magnitude of, of $60 million potentially in savings from, one, um, from just one quarter's worth of the work that we're doing. The ongoing, again, uh, not as big. Um, again, those are, those, those are the avoided costs. It, it, we, we don't track this by early and ongoing, but the last one I think I want to call your attention to is we do I identify over issuances and then we make efforts to collect them, and that number was about $6 million in the quarter. Be happy to take questions or turn it over to the other panel members. Very good. Uh, quite thorough. We appreciate that. We will get to our other panelists in just a minute. I know Senator Mitchell has a question. I did. Thank you. Um, I realize I made an assumption about what you meant. What I just The word just escaped me, not hijacking. What was the earlier word you used when you talked about when benefits are trafficked? trafficked. Thank you. Trafficked. So I, I realize that in, in my head, in my experience, trafficked could mean Senator Monning is the CalFresh beneficiary. Um, I either give him cash or whatever our barter system is to get his EBT card, and then I use it. But you made a comment about, um, you know, the use of the card. But the reality is, I guess the point I'm trying to make is, if if it's trafficked and I obtain the card and I'm not the eligible beneficiary, all I can use the card for, however, are for eligible food services within EBT. Yeah. Yes. Okay. E e ex except for retailers. The fact that I'm the except for retailers that are being closed down, who are essentially doing things like essentially accepting a swipe and saying, "I perhaps sold you a hundred dollars worth." They collect a hundred dollars, but perhaps they only give fifty dollars worth of food, or perhaps Got they only it. give fifty dollars in cash. But yes, the Got card you. can can only be used legitimately for okay. free purchase. I just wanted to make make that distinction. I understand the trafficking concept, but. I didn't want us to think that we had a problem beyond what you just suggested in terms of the use of the actual card and, and the benefit itself. Okay, thank you. 